everyone and welcome to Instant Biology by Dr. Nila. Today we will be talking about the concept of chemical interactions. Now this is the basic of biochemistry. If you start studying biochemistry then you should be very well aware about the different bonding patterns, the different types of bondings that take place in biochemistry to be more precise. For example, covalent bonding, for example, ionic interactions, van der Waals, hydrogen bonding, all of this you should be very well aware about. So, uh, I have already made uh, this video in Hindi, but for our English audience, we are making this video uh, in English also. So, I will be starting with a little bit of chemical interactions and then I would be moving on into the covalent bonding. Uh, today, uh, the main focus area would be covalent bonding and after that we would be moving on to the other types of bonding. Remember, this is a very very important topic with respect to the different life science examinations that you might be giving in future. So let us start. Chemical interactions. Now what does chemical interactions means? Basically when two components, when two chemicals, when two entities, they interact between each other, they form bonds. Now these bonds basically can be of different types. If I am talking about uh, an individual, if I am talking about a living system, now different there are different things that start interaction. For example, amino acids. Now amino acids will definitely interact to form proteins. For example, the glycine, the alanines, the valines, the isoleucines, all of these are different types of amino acids. And these different amino acids will be interacting with each other to form different types of proteins. Another very good example can be quoted of nucleotides. Now there are different nucleotides, ATP, GTP, CTP, TTP, if I'm talking about the DNA and if I'm talking about RNA, it can be UTP also. So uh, these all interact with each other to form the DNA or RNA. Now there are different types of chemical interactions that are taking place inside a living system, right? And these can be majorly classified into two types. That means the chemical interactions or the bondings that are taking place between the biomolecules uh, since we are talking about biochemistry over here. So the interactions or the, uh, the bonding that is forming between the different uh, biomolecules can be classified into two types and these uh, classes are covalent bonds and the non-covalent interactions. So the covalent interactions and the non-covalent interactions. To be more specific, if I am talking about the energy or the strength of these types of bonds, the covalent bonds are very high in strength or they have a very strong bonding. So when a covalent bond is present, the bonding will be very strong. If I'm talking about the non-covalent interactions, these are majorly weak in nature. So the different types of non-covalent interactions can be, it can be of ionic nature, it can be of hydrogen bonding, it can be of van der Waals forces and it can also be of hydrophobic interactions. So these are the different types of interactions. If I majorly classify it into two parts. So I believe this slide would be clear in your mind. Now let us move on to the next slide. The next slide, in this slide, I would be delving deep into the covalent bonding. So again, uh, to remind you that this lecture would be about covalent bonding and as we proceed, we would be discussing about the other bonds also. So let us start with covalent bonding. What is a covalent bond? Now, a covalent bond is formed by sharing of electron. Now, you need to remember this term, sharing. Sharing of electron between two atoms. Now, if there are two atoms, then these two atoms might be involved in sharing of the electrons. Why they are involved in sharing or why do they need to do this? I would be talking about that also, but just in, but in a bit. So, Sharing of the electrons between the two atoms and why? Why would they want to share the electrons? Why would I want to share something that I have uh, with you? Because I would definitely have a benefit out of that. Then only I would be sharing my things with you. So the benefit that one atom gets when it shares the electron with others because it, it gets the inert state or inert gas configuration. You would be knowing that inert gases have eight electrons in their outermost shell. So every atom wants to get or wants to attain that inert state configuration or inert gas configuration. That is why they want to share their electrons with the other ones. So if an atom is sharing, then definitely the, the reason behind that is to attain the inert gas configuration. So this is uh, clear, I believe. Let us move on to the next concept that how many types of covalent bonds are there? 
Understand this that the covalent bonds can be defined or can be classified into two types. The first one is non-polar covalent bond. What do you mean by non-polar covalent bond? So when let, let me just uh, give an example. Let me just draw something. So suppose there is a atom A and there is another atom B. Now they are involved in the sharing of electrons, right? And the sharing is happening in such a way that the electrons are more towards the B atom like this. Now why would they be towards the B atom? What extra property does the B atom has that the A atom does not have? So B atom actually is B is more electronegative. So B atom is more electronegative, understood? So when B atom would be more electronegative, it would have a higher strength to pull the electrons towards itself. Now, since A is not that electronegative, it will not be have it will not be able to pull the electrons towards itself. So B will be having the I mean I just want to say that the B will be having electrons more towards itself than A would be having. Now because of that, the B atom would be having a slightly negative charge and A atom would be having a slightly positive charge. You can also call this as partial negative and partial positive charges. Why am I saying partial negative and partial positive? Why can't I say positive and negative? Because the bond has yet not broken. The bond is still there. Only when the bond breaks, then we can say that the positive or the negative charges uh, are forming. We can say that in terms of the ionic bond. For example, NaCl. Na has a positive charge. Na plus it is in the form of an ion. Chloride Cl minus. Okay. I believe you would have got this uh, clear in your mind. So when a non-polar bond or non-polar covalent bond is formed, what is the uh, science behind this? For example, uh, if I talk about uh, basically this concept is of uh, the polar covalent bond. This one is for the polar covalent bond. Whatever I explained was of polar covalent bond. And when the two atoms that are involved are of same electronegativity, for example, oxygen molecule, one oxygen atom would be here, another oxygen atom would be here and they have both the same electronegativities. Now, because of the same electronegativities, they would not be, there would be no partial positive or partial negative charges. That means they would be non-polar in nature. Now this is basically polar. Why? Because two poles are formed, right? Positive and negative two poles are formed. That is why this bonding is called as polar covalent bonding. But if I say about oxygen, this oxygen is double bonded with another oxygen. Now the electrons would be just in the middle of these two oxygen atoms. No oxygen atom would be in a position to pull the electron towards itself more. Therefore, this type of bonding is called as non-polar. There will be no poles that will be formed. So, when I am talking about non-polar covalent bond, non-polar covalent bond example is hydrogen molecule or oxygen molecule or for the matter of fact nitrogen. So, hydrogen and hydrogen because equal sharing is present and electronegativity difference between them is zero. That is why you can call this bond as non-covalent bond. Now let me talk about the polar covalent bond. I have already talked mo uh, much about it over here. So polar covalent bond will have electronegativity difference between the atoms and for example hydrogen and fluorine HF hydrogen fluoride HF. So definitely fluorine will be having electrons more towards itself than hydrogen would be having and therefore this bonding or this bond would be called as or this bond would be basically polar covalent bond. Let me just show you how the covalent interactions take place. So over here you can see that there is an atom A and there is an atom B. Okay. So now you can see that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. There are 7 electrons present in atom A 
And if I talk about B, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, again 7 atoms, 7 electrons are present in B also. They both are having 7, 7 uh, electrons. Now they require one electron to complete their octet or to come into the or to gain the inert gas, con inert gas configuration. Now the sharing of the electron leads to the inert state configuration. This is what I was telling. So if they are sharing the electrons, this A atom will also get this uh, green one. That means it will comprise of 8 electrons. Similarly, B will be also getting this black one. Therefore, it is also having the inert gas configuration or 8 electrons. So this is why, this is the reason why the sharing happens. This is what why I wanted to tell you that this is the reason why sharing is happening. Now let us move forward into the next slide. Coming back to the point of the non-polar covalent bond, in case of non-polar covalent bond, the electronegativities or the electronegativity difference should be not equal to zero. As I said, because the example was H F. Now you know definitely that fluorine is the most electronegative atom. Hydrogen is not that electronegative. So the electrons will be shifted towards the fluorine and we can say that the electronegativity difference is not equal to zero. So electron pair is shifted towards the fluorine. Now because of this the partial negative and partial positive charges will be present. So this fluorine will be having a partial negative charge. Hydrogen will be having a partial positive charge. This will be seen. Next magnitude of electronegativity difference defines the degree of polarity what does this mean more is the nature of the more is the difference between the electronegativities more would be the polarity remember this higher is the electronegativity difference higher would be the polarity of the non covalent bond okay now Again, the great, greater is the electronegativity difference, greater will be the polarity. The same thing is written over here. That means more is the electronegativity difference or you can say that higher is the electronegativity difference, more would be the polarity of the bond or you can say that more polar would be the bond. So I hope this is clear. Now let us move on to the next point. Now covalent bond is different from the coordinate bond. I have seen many students confuse covalent and coordinate bond. Now they are two different bonds. You should be very careful about them. So it is different by the different from the coordinate bond. What is the difference? In case of covalent bond, the electron is contributed by the two atoms. The electrons are contributed by two atoms. And in case of the coordinate bond, the electron is contributed by the same atom. So this is the concept of coordinate bond. This is coordinate bond. So in case of coordinate bond, the electrons are contributed by the, by the same atom. Whereas in case of the covalent bond, the electron is contributed by both the uh, atoms. For example, this is a you can see that this is a coordinate bond. Now you, see, you can see that the C atom is having the inert gas configuration it is having the eight electrons one two three four five six seven eight it is having the inert gas configuration but it is sharing two electrons with d because d is not having the inert gas configuration so in this way you can see that coordinate bond is shown from the donor towards the recipient so c is the donor and d is the recipient Okay. So I believe this is clear in your mind. Now let me move on to the next point. So energy required to break the covalent bond would be directly proportional to the number of covalent bonds. This is very simple, right? So if there is a single bond, the energy required to break it will be less. If there is a double bond, the energy required to break it will be slightly more. If there will be a triple bond, the energy would be the highest. The energy that you require to break it would be the highest. Now, you can see that this is the bond order. That means the uh, this is a single bond, this is a double bond. And bond energy that is required to break the single bond is 83 kilocalorie. It, if you are trying to break a double bond, it will be 146 kilocalorie. The strength of the bond also depends upon the atoms that are participating in the bond. For example, OH. If I'm talking about OH, 
oxygen and hydrogen are present the electronegativity difference over here is high now you can see that the bond energy is 110 kilocalorie whereas carbon and hydrogen the electronegativity difference is almost nil basically they all they carbon and hydrogen are having the same type of electronegativity so it is 99 kilocalorie i believe this is clear now let us move forward important points regarding the covalent bonds so most prominently seen in proteins and nucleotides now where do you see these covalent bonds it is most prominently seen in proteins how come you can see it in proteins because you see peptide bonds basically are the examples of the covalent bonds and disulfide bonds are also the example of covalent bonds so uh, proteins inside proteins you can see covalent bonds apart from that you can also see that in nucleotides where do you see uh, that in nucleotides if i talk about the yes, if i talk about the uh, bond between bond in case of uh, nucleotides the bond that is present is called as phosphodiester bond phospho phosphodiester bond and if i'm talking about the bonding in proteins it is called as peptide bond right so these are the two bonds that are present that are having the covalent nature okay now let us talk about the nature of the covalent bond what are the salient features of the covalent bond they are strong bonds they are stable bonds and they can never break under spontaneous conditions that means if you say that it has broken broken automatically it will never happen the automatic breaking and the forming of the bonds are often seen in case of the weak bonds but since you know that the covalent bond is a strong bond you can never see spontaneous breaking of this bond next greater number of covalent bonds are directly proportional to the bond strength and it is directly proportional to one by bond length what does this mean more are the number of covalent bonds more will be the bond strength but lesser will be the bond length for example if i say this is one atom this is another atom they are connected with one bond okay so the strength will be something you know if there is another bond that is coming in between there are double two bonds definitely the bond will be stronger and the two atoms will come more close to each other again a triple bond forms the atoms will become more closer to each other and bond strength will improve so bond strength increases and the bond length decreases if i'm talking about the covalent bond so this is the concept let me move forward to the diagrammatic basically this uh, depiction so c single bond c one bond double bond triple bond so you can see that in this direction the strength of the bond is improving strength of the bond is increasing and in this direction you can see that the length will be increasing the single bond will have the highest length and the triple bond will have the lowest length smallest length okay so this is the concept i believe this uh, slide would be clear to you next let us move on to the next slide yes so the number of covalent bonds an atom can form is called as valence now this is a new terminology so how many covalent bonds an atom can form can be given as valence for example oxygen can form two double bonds like this if i'm forming the oxygen molecule o2 it is having two double bonds so the valence over here is two if i'm talking about sodium sodium can form one double one sodium can form basically one bond therefore its valence is one so this is the concept how much how many covalent bonds can be formed is denoted by the uh, the uh, the basically valence okay now bond angle let us talk about the bond angle so the bond angle between the covalent bonds originating from a single atom will always approximately remain the same what do i mean by this whenever you are talking about the covalent bonds by uh, formed by actually one atom then you would see that the bonds or the uh, they, the the bond angle basically would remain almost the same okay and if for example i talk about tetrahedron okay if uh, this is a carbon atom and it can form the four bonds 1 2 3 and 4 it is forming four bonds so the bond angle that you see is 109 degree so this is the bond angle that is seen in case of tetrahedron sp3 hybridization okay 
so bond angle will remain almost the same almost fixed if the covalent bonds are present i already told you about the bond strength concept the bond length concept this also i told you now let us move on to the next thing freedom of rotation what does what do you mean by freedom of rotation freedom of rotation means that the single covalent bond would permit free rotation now if you see this if there is there are two atoms like this and only one bond is present then the freedom of rotation is very high it can be rotated like any this any any in any orientation so freedom of rotation for a single covalent bond is very high double and triple bonds become rigid or they create rigidity that means so much of movement is not possible when a double or triple bond is formed so if i uh, write a depiction for rotations possible you can see that c single bond c c double bond c c triple bond c c single bond c is having the highest rotations possible c double bond c is going to have uh, lesser rotations and c triple bond c will be having the least rotations that can be seen so hopefully this would be clear to you now i wanted to add one more point when i was talking about the uh, polar covalent and non polar covalent bond i told you that the polar uh, covalent bond let me show it to you once again if i'm talking about the polar covalent bond polar covalent bond if i showed you that suppose this is a molecule and this is b and b is having the slightly negative charge a is having the slightly positive charge because the electrons are more shifted towards the b atom what can you conclude out of this definitely this is a polar molecule and because of the polarity it will definitely be soluble in water why can i say that it can be soluble in water or we can also say that it is hydro philic why can i say that it is hydrophilic i can say that because water is also a polar solvent so there is always a phenomena of like dissolves like that means water will always want to dissolve a like compound for example it will always want to dissolve a compound that is polar in nature it can be polar uncharged and it can be polar charged so this is the thing that i wanted to include i believe the concept of covalent bonding would be clear in your mind in the next lecture i would be talking about the ionic bond and in the next lecture i would be talking about the hydrogen bonding so thank you for paying attention and if you like the lecture please hit the like button do subscribe to my channel and share with your friends thank you and have a good day